Hello everyone, uh, welcome to part 2 on our Flying the Airbus A320 series. So uh, if you remember from last time, uh, we took a look at a bunch of different ways that we could go ahead and get information as far as our flight plans go and kind of get all those things that we're going to need before we even get inside the airplane. Uh, today what we're going to be taking a look at is just the systems on the aircraft. We're not going to be doing any fancy flying here, we're just going to be going over a general sort of, I guess you want to call it lecture style uh, or whatever method you want to call it, way of sort of looking through everything that goes on in these planes, especially if you're new to these kinds of planes. You know, some of the systems may seem complicated, but they're actually fairly intuitive uh, once you kind of get the hang of them. So let's go ahead and jump inside. Uh, for those of you who are coming from GA land, uh, this has already gotten pretty intimidating. Uh, you notice there's no giant stick in between on an Airbus A320. We, of course, have our little side stick here, which is uh, quite a bit different than what you probably used to before. Uh, notice, uh, because this is a fly-by-wire airplane, uh, we don't have a million little switches and knobs like you probably do on the big old yoke on uh, traditional aircraft. We even have a spot over here where we can slap our little tablet PC, which I think is just great. And, of course, uh, we have the all-important handle for opening the window here. But, unfortunately, as you can see, that's inoperative. Ah! Uh, one of the things you'll probably hear me mention more than once as we're looking through everything here is on account of the fact that a lot of the systems here, while they are present, are not complete. You know, at some point in the future, we're going to probably get ridiculously fancy and expensive uh, payware aircraft that are going to go into every little detail. But I'm going to try to do the best I can to be general. So first things first, um, as we're kind of getting this all purpose, um, we notice that none of the lights are on up here except for this one that says external power. It's going to be kind of difficult to show off some of the systems unless I go up here and actually get us some electricity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to request the good folks in the ground go ahead and plug us into the gpu which is also known as the ground power unit if you actually take a look at this little truck right here you can see this little black wire kind of plugging underneath us right where in the wheel well is the ground power unit is basically an external power connection uh, at most airlines which you'll actually actually it's airports you'll actually have a little wire that can actually trail underneath our little jetway here that you can plug into generally you know then this is again from interviewing pilots uh, who fly these things uh, versus me who definitely do not uh, they'll say things like well you can use that for general setup but you can't use it because the power is not reliable basically what they're saying is the power that comes out of the ground that comes out of the airport is not conditioned so as a result um it's not going to be as smooth but for us in the flight simulator it really doesn't matter use the power kind of power you want all right let's go ahead and take a look up above the bed and we'll sort of understand everything we're looking at here First things first, up in the top left corner, you have what you call your ADIRs. This is your INS system. Uh, unfortunately for us, or maybe fortunately, depending on who you are, uh, you'll notice that this system has no control in Flight Simulator. Basically, what these are are inertial navigation systems based on laser ring gyroscopes. Even though we have a global positioning system on the aircraft, uh, redundancy is important in case something doesn't work or we have a bad GPS signal. So what these will actually do is they'll act as an inertial platform in the event that we lose signal or we can't, we're too far in the middle of the ocean and for some reason we can't get a good connection to something. So we can actually use these as a basis for our navigation. We actually don't even need GPS if we tell the system where we're starting. Next one down from that, we have our flight control. Uh, we're not going to worry about this. There's actually two pieces to this. This is basically going to allow you to shut specific types of flight control in uh, fly-by-wire systems on and off. Notice you got one on one side and you got one on the other. Everything has to be redundant in an airliner. You know, if one system fails, you can't have the other one. Down here, we basically have our evacuation system. You know, if we need to go ahead and open this light, we can make all sorts of flashy things. We can just create a little horn at the sound of the horn bail. <laughs> we have some emergency electrical power. Again, we have an emergency RAT, which just stands for Ram Air Turbine. We also have an extra generator. Down here, we have a GPWS, which unfortunately we have no control over. What this is, is it's simply going to tell you that you're getting very close to the ground. It, you know, terrain, terrain, pull up. I'm sure you all heard that plenty of times in all of your flying. That's the system which we can actually bypass completely. It is a radar system. Coming down here, of course, we have our flight recorder, very important. We have our oxygen, and this is the magical switch that when you push it, it's going to dump a bunch of oxygen mass in everybody's face. Always kind of fun when you pull that little lever. Coming down here, uh, if somebody needs to call us, uh, they go ahead and light up one of these little bells right here and we can push a button and we can talk to them. Coming down here, we have our windshield wipers. Yes, airliners have windshield wipers too. Generally, you're going to be traveling so fast that the windshield wipers will not be needed on account of the fact that the water will just kind of shoot off the uh, window itself. That does happen, uh, but it doesn't always happen, so that's handy. By the way, please don't use windshield wipers on dry glass. That's just one of those things you don't do. It scratches things up. All right, coming up top, we have our fire suppression system. On an airline or any aircraft that you're going to be carrying any sort of passengers, you have to have some kind of fire suppression system. Now, the way this works is incredibly simple. There's basically two different switches here. You have one switch that you flip up this panel and jam on it with your hand. What that will do is it will cut off all fuel connections to that particular system, whether it's engine one, the auxiliary power unit, which is a little mini engine in the back, we'll look at later, or engine number two. Uh, the moment I flip this thing, mash it, it goes in, like I said, cuts all those connections. These two buttons on opposite sides basically spray 
a bunch of uh, good nasty stuff into the engine to try to put out any sort of fire that we uh, have detected. This thing lights up in a giant ball when it comes to being warning with a fire. Notice we can't push it, which is kind of sad. There's also this really fun button that you can press to test it, and it causes it to flash and makes all sorts of angry bell noises, but unfortunately we don't have that today. Coming down from there, you have your hydraulic systems. Uh, we have a number of different hydraulic systems on an Airbus. Now remember, because we're such a large airplane, physically moving the controls by hand would just simply be impossible. It would require thousands of pounds of physical force in order to be able to safely move. And it's not going to be terribly reliable, especially if you're turbulent. So what we do on an airliner is we actually use hydraulic pumps in order to actually uh, move the controls for us using actuators. Now the interesting thing here is we have multiple hydraulic systems. In an Airbus, you have one system called green, one system called blue, and one system called yellow. Whenever you're dealing with any sort of system where stuff is moving around, whether it be electricity or some sort of fuel, you're always going to notice this little arrow pattern, which is going to tell you who talks to whom. Now, if you take a look here, we can see we have a blue system here, which has an emergency electric pump, and it also has the ability to actually go ahead and push hydraulic pressure into the other systems in the event that they fail. You'll also notice that each system on the right and left here has its own separate pumping system. These hydraulic pumps are designed to be redundant. If one of them fails, you should be able to power them. Another magical switch here in the middle is called the ram air turbine, which is this little tiny propeller that drops off the side of the aircraft that gives us hydraulic pressure in the event of an emergency. It's worth noting, and this is very interesting for those of you who want to go into a little more depth here, is that if your hydraulic system fails, certain things fail with it. For example, you can have one hydraulic system uh, resulting while well, losing your brakes, for example, if it fails, or you lose um, all the spoilers on the left side. And again, every airliner has got their own kind of way to do it. Now, the interesting thing with hydraulic pumps is uh, we have no control of them, so it's not something you need to stress about in the simulator. Coming down here, you have your fuel pumps. Now, remember, in this aircraft, we have two wing tanks, and we have... Um, well, actually, yeah, we have a left and a right wing tank, and we also have a center tank. In general, if you're going to be traveling short distances, you're never going to be using your center tank. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is the fact that you don't want to have lightweight wings and heavy bodies of airplanes. It tends to snap things. The interesting thing here is you'll notice that this light will be on when it is off. I know that sounds a little weird, but the Airbus people believe in the system where you always want to have a light on to let you know that something is not in the correct position. For example, you notice my exterior power light is on. You also know I'm getting a fault light with my generators because obviously we're not powered up right now. So that explains why that's going on. So if we want to turn a fuel pump around, off, we can just go click it like this. Note that in this aircraft, we have an auxiliary power unit that is fed from any sort of fuel coming out of one of these two positions. In this particular case, we can pump it right out of the center tank into this, or we can pump it out of the left tank into the APU. The APU on its own is smart enough to know to turn on one of the fuel pumps in order to feed itself, however, so that's not something you have to panic about. Coming down here, uh, we have the electrical systems. Notice, again, we've got these process diagrams that tell us what we have. On this aircraft, we have what they call two electrical buses. They're actually independent of each other. You have the uh, AC bus 2, which is on the right side. You have the AC bus 1, which is over here on the left side. These systems power different parts of the aircraft, but again, they're designed to be redundant. In the event of an emergency, you'll notice, by the way, that we can link the two systems together, just like we can with the hydraulic systems. Again, we have no control over that. Whenever we're interested in what goes where, we can just study where the process diagrams take us. Like you'll notice right now, both of my batteries are in the off position. If I wanted to turn them on, I could go ahead and click both of them. Notice as soon as I flick them on, my battery voltage spiked to 28.5. When I shut them both off, it drops to 25.4. The reason it does that is because remember, I'm running off the external power truck here. Now, if I press this, oh, <laughs> everything's out. So now if I turn my batteries on, I'm only running off of my batteries. Now keep in mind, my batteries, I have two of them, basically, so I have enough voltage to be able to power up the APU so that I can run on my own electricity. Go ahead and pop those off. This is so bad. I'm so sorry, sorry. And of course, we also have another special generator called an APU, which we'll take a look at in a minute. These switches over here don't mean anything to us. Uh, this, <laughs> this can separate the drive mechanically in the event of an emergency. We have, of course, our galley, which if you don't turn this on, you don't get coffee. So it's always recommended that you take a look at that. Coming down here, this is the least simulated component of the entire aircraft, and this is basically our air pressure system. They call it air conditioning, but it's, it, it's complicated. We basically have a couple different systems here. Our first system is basically where we're going to get high pressure air. We have two bleeds, one per engine. Again, I believe I don't know this engine as well as most people would do. They could tell me exactly what part of the engine. It's usually the 13th stator, as though so we're going to suck the air out and they're going to push it into the system. Now, the air we suck out of these engines or the APU, we can do a lot of stuff with. We can use them to start the engines. We can use them to uh, keep the uh, whole entire aircraft warm or cold. That's what your pack are providing. Unfortunately, we do not have these simulated, so you don't have to panic about shutting them off. 
And of course, we can take all that air and keep us nice and warm, keep our ears, you know, nice and pressurized. Everything's going to be kind of nice here. The important thing for us, however, is whenever we're doing a start, we need to make sure we get some sort of external pressure source, either from the ground, which we don't have simulated, or the APU, which we're going to have to start up. Coming down there, uh, we have our anti-ice panel. Anybody's familiar with anti-ice, probably familiar with this procedure. We have wing anti-ice, which is a pretty impressive system. We have our engine anti-ice, as notice we have two of them. We also have our probe anti-ice. Uh, notice, interestingly, the probe is set to auto unless you click it, in which case it would shut it off. This button for us in the simulator is just going to turn on the wind shield anti-ice. This system should always be on as soon as the aircraft starts moving and shut off when you're no longer moving. This will be our cabin pressure control. Again, as you travel in high altitudes, we need to have some sort of way to go ahead and uh, safely pressurize the aircraft. We don't have to worry about this in the simulator because all this is handled completely manually. Coming down from here, we have the uh, dreaded light panel. Uh, there's a lot of different lights. Uh, we'll deal with this uh, when we actually get to starting this aircraft later on. Note that our landing lights have two different types. So we have the kind that retract from the wing, and we also have one on the nose that we can actually deploy separately, which I find, you know, it, it's kind of a neat little touch kind of a thing like that. All right, so swinging over to the right, uh, we have, of course, our APU switch. Um, we're going to be dealing with this a little later on when we look at startup as well as uh, getting the FMS all pre-programmed. And over here on the right, we have a bunch of internal lights, if you want to kind of think about it a different way. We also have our emergency little external uh, exit lights on that we can turn on, and everybody's favorite little boo, boo, to go ahead and tell people, please don't smoke in the plane. Coming up to the top right. We have the ability to switch some audio. We've got a little microphone speaker there. We have our audio call panel. This doesn't mean anything to us in Flight Simulator, but basically, if you're looking for the short version, is each one of these knobs controls the volume of the individual radio. Notice how many different radios we have here. We also have the ability to actually click the switch to decide what radio we're actually talking on. Now, in our case, and none of this is critical because, like I said, we can't even select it, so don't stress out. Coming down here, we have the flight controls. This is the right system as well. And now we have the cargo heat controls. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of control over here. If there was a fire in an emergency, we actually have a special, um, basically, fire retardant system that we can flip the switch and go smash and go ahead and turn that on. We also have some very powerful ventilation technology. And, of course, we have the windshield wipers on the left. So that's it for the overhead panel. Obviously, all these systems are all, all interact, but we'll take a look at them procedurally. The nice thing about an Airbus, as opposed to some other aircraft, is um, if the light is off, chances are you're doing something correctly, so you don't have to stress about it. All right, let's go ahead and bounce, bounce down to here, over to the MCP. Uh, this is the master control, not master control program, main control panel. Basically, this is where you're going to dictate how, how the autopilot is running, especially this panel right here. Information with this is, um, without getting too sophisticated, I do have a video dedicated to this one, because it does get a little complicated, is basically you have one control for speed, one for heading, you have one for altitude, you have one for vertical speed. Now, in an Airbus, yeah, the philosophy is that if you want the Airbus computer to go ahead and control everything, you simply click the up arrow to push the button inward. If you want to manually control it, you simply click the bottom part of a button to put it onto manual mode. So right now I can manually select two knots. If I push it in, the computer is going to go ahead and decide for me. I haven't programmed the FMS yet, so it's going to get a little grumpy. Coming over here, of course, if I want to go ahead and do managed altitude, I push it in. If I want to do a selected altitude, I pull it out. Notice the little light comes off to let you know the computer no longer controls it. Coming up here, of course, I can level the airplane off, or I can go ahead and engage to see it. Notice our approach autopilot button, again, is over here. And notice if we're in a hurry to expedite our descent or um, climb, you can go ahead and push this button. Does not work. We have two different autopilots here, and of course, we have the localizer select here. Swinging over on this side, uh, this is basically going to be a control panel responsible for anything selecting your navigation map over on this side of things. A couple different modes. I uh, have plan mode, which is invisible because we don't have a plan loaded. We have arc mode, which everybody's familiar with. It basically draws a compass arc here. Navigation mode is the same thing as arc, except it gives you a compass rose so you can see around you a little bit better. VOR would give you any VR information. Uh, if you want to dial in VOR, you're going to have to come down here and switch it over to navigation radio and actually dial in the VOR that you're interested in in order to use it. LS simply means, L again, this is landing system. This would be like your instrument landing system. Note that while you can put this information here, you can notice we've got a glide soap here. You have to actually press the LS button to get it to display over here on your flight director. Directly below those two switches, uh, we have the ability to turn on ADF and VOR information. Remember, if you're going to use any of these, you have to make sure you program them into the radio nav, otherwise they will not show up. And note, you can go ahead and turn more than one of them on at once if you need to do so. Folks who are familiar with the G1000, uh, you've already seen these things like that. 
Next, uh, swinging over here real quick, uh, we have our good old-fashioned light controls. How uh, We can control the brightness of our PFD as well as our navigation display here. As usual, if you're flying at night, you want to turn those things down. We can go ahead and control a loudspeaker. Not. Notice we have no big yoke in the middle of us, and we don't have to stress about that too, too much. Swinging over here, uh, we have our handy-dandy uh, terrain radar here. If you turn this on, this will display any terrain that is in front of you. Keep in mind, the range on this terrain is excessive. And of course, it's not going to show us anything because um, we can't see anything. There's just basically a building in our way. You really don't want to turn this on to the ground. It's kind of rude to the ground crew. To the right of that, you have the ability to go ahead and dial in your barometric pressure. This is an important concept. Um, folks who want a short, easy way to do it, just press the B key and it instantaneously snaps to what you need it to be without stressing out about it too, too much. This is also a backup navigation information in the event that something bad happens. Uh, normally, we can control the bugs on it, which are going to be our speed. Don't stress about that too, too much. Swinging over here, we have our two different displays. We have our PFD and we have our ND. The PFD is basically going to provide us with all the critical information. A notice over here on our left is going to be our airspeed. This is indicated airspeed. Over here on our right is going to be our indicated altitude. This little weird thing on the far right is actually our vertical speed. Notice we can get up to 6,000 feet per minute. Everybody's familiar with this tool here, but the important thing here is up here where it tells us what our autopilot is doing. This will tell us both what our um, thrusters are. Uh, thrusters? What's a thruster? It'll tell us what our engines are trying to do. It'll tell us what our roll program is trying to do. It'll tell us what our climb or pitch program is trying to do, as well as give us any warnings. Swinging so over there from there, we go over to the middle. Uh, this is a, kind of our ECAS system. This is basically going to be giving us all the critical information about the aircraft. For example, it tells me that one of the doors is open, which um, doesn't surprise me given the fact that I've got a, uh, <laughs> probably this door right here is a wide open, so I'm not going to stress about that too much. It also tells me the parking brake's engaged. In the real plane, of course, if we were sitting here on the ground with nothing going, we'd have about 15 different warnings. It would say page two because <laughs> we're so busted. Over here as well, you have all your navigation, uh, navigation, you have your engine controls. It tells you how hot the engines are, how fast they're turning, how fast the interstage is turning, how much fuel they're sucking down. You also have a neat little display that goes ahead and indicates what your flat positions are at this time. Right now, they're up, so we don't have to stress about it. Coming down here, uh, this is another part of that. Now, unfortunately for us, uh, this is not a complete ECAM. We only get two buttons. We have the engine button and we have the fuel button. We don't get any of these fun bleed or air conditioning or door buttons or anything like that, which is a shame. The important thing here, however, is it tells us things like how much fuel we've got on board in kilograms, tells us our outside temperature. It goes ahead and tells us, you know, what a gross weight is. Obviously, we're pretty heavy. We're carrying a pretty full load of um, holiday makers today. It also tells us what our fuel is. Notice no fuel in the middle, just some fuel on the left, just some fuel on the right, and everything's looking pretty good. Again, this is in kilograms. This is in pounds, so don't panic. You know, if I come up here and do fuel, ah, uh, what if I don't? No, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. This little box right here, by the way, it gives you the ability to send in-flight messages. It's actually a pretty cool system. Next one we're going to be looking at is uh, this guy right here. This is called your FMS. This is not actually your FMS. This is the MCDU. The FMS is just your flight management system, which is linked to a flight managed computer, which has an input device, which is what we're actually looking at right now here. Um, this is a pretty sophisticated piece of machinery, and it's going to have a dedicated video. The important thing that you really, really need to know about it is the fact that uh, when you're just kind of cruising around, I do leave, usually leave it in the progress page. If you're know, worried about what your flight plan is, you can match the flight plan page. Like you said, there's absolutely nothing in here yet because we haven't programmed it. We'll take a look at that in a later video as well. Note that this is the master computer of this aircraft. You know, if anything gets messed up in here, it's going to mess up everything else, unless you want to fly things manually, which you're always welcome to do. Down from there, we have our navigation radio, our radio system. This is kind of our manual radio, if you want to kind of think of it another way. We have all of our radios. Notice we have three separate, very high frequency radio systems on here. And the thing I love about it is the fact that, again, I can go in here and pre select. Let's say I know my next frequency is a 122.8. Uh, 80. I can put that in there. I can put this on VHF. I can go switch. Notice we have an HF radio. <laughs> when people see HF for the first time, their mind tends to get a little blown because they're like, wait a minute, can you have a number that low? Yes, you can. You just need a really long antenna. We also have our other HF and we have our AM, which unfortunately, ah, it's not going to work the way we want. And basically says, don't use FM. I know that sounds weird. Other radios we have down here, oh, we can listen to our VOR if we want to kind of put that on the loudspeaker, ILS, MLS, ADF as well as our BFO if we're working with another ADF. And of course, we can and shut the entire system off. Coming down here, we saw a copy of this up above our heads. That's going to be that system up there in the top right. Basically, this allows us to select what frequency we're working on. For example, I want to work on VHF2. So now if I do VHF2, you'll notice that I'm now talking to VH2. If you want to shut the audio off, you can click it. You can click it again to shut it off completely. You'll notice that these little buttons go in and out like this that tell us whether or not something has been turned on or off. We also have the ability, of course, to you know, turn on our VR. We, can, ah, we can't do that in this one. I, I got ahead of myself. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. We should be able to shut off our other radios that way. Coming down here, we have a floodlight as well as the panel light. 
If it was a little darker outside, this is a wonderful way to light things up. Generally, with the floodlight, we don't want to crank this thing. This tool down here is going to be dedicated to your weather radar and terrain radar. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of systems. We can come over here and uh, set it to system one, or we can set it to system two. doesn't make a really, really strong difference here. Normally, you could adjust the tilt, which is something that's really, really critically important. You could, of course, call in the different systems and the different types of filters and everything as well. Coming down from here, we have the speed brake lever. This is basically uh, acts as a spoiler. You'll see ground spoiler up at the tippy top. What this does is this deploys a small little, uh, basically a fin that comes out of the top of our wings. It creates a tremendous amount of drag to help slow us down. Moving up from there, uh, we have an emergency gear extension. I love this one. So what you have to do is you have to lift this and go rah, 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 to basically unwind the front gear so that gravity can allow it to drop down on its own. You have to shake the plane back and forth. We have our parking brake. Our parking brake should always be engaged unless you're moving. Coming up from there, we have a rudder trim. If you accidentally do the deed, you can always reset that. Remember, this is a fly-by-wire aircraft, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Swinging up here, this is our master start. Uh, this is an interesting take on master start. These two switches right here are basically supposed to be dedicated to turning the fuel on and off, which they are. These would normally be our starter switches, and this allows us to select our mode. Now, if you want to have some fun, you can actually set the engine to crank, which will cause them to start turning over without actually introducing any fuel to them. Coming up here, here is our mighty, mighty terrifying throttle real quickly. And the neat thing with this aircraft is uh, this throttle control is actually got detents on it. So when I push this forward, You can actually see how it sticks into those different components. The throttle on this thing is completely automatic. It does not move on its own. Uh, basically, when you push the thing forward, you're telling the engines, this is what I like to do. Do I want to climb? Do I want to use my flex or maximum continuous thrust? Or do I want to do takeoff or go around mode? There's also reverse. If you want to switch into reverse, you have to press the button on your keyboard. Usually, there's these two little lift finger lifts where you have to kind of stick your fingers and go click. See how they go snap. You have to lift them up so that you can pull them back. Don't worry about it. You can just put a button on your keyboard to control them. You will want a button for a thrust reverse with this aircraft. Okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, if you come all the way, 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 way over here, uh, you've got everybody's favorite little system that's basically going to be your transponder. An important thing to know about this one is your altitude reporting switch is down here. You want to make sure that's switched to the on position. You also want to make sure this whole system is set either to auto or to on. Auto works perfectly fine, but again, I like to flip it on. And you can dial in your new frequency for that right here. These switches uh, don't affect us. Again, uh, TCAS is going to be a little different depending. Of course, if you're in the United States, you can find VFR. You might have a squawk code that looks like this. Okay, so that was a lot of information, but I thought it was important to kind of go over it because there's really a lot going on with this particular aircraft. And kind of understanding how all the pieces sort of work as you're working with them makes your life a little bit simpler in future videos. Next time what we'll do is we'll uh, take a look at setting up the FMS as well as uh, setting up kind of the MCP for a flight. Enjoy.